welcome back to my channel and welcome to the very first mini series video for the month of March. And this month's topic is solved nobody. So I know you guys love my solved series. That is probably my most requested series to bring back over and over and over again. And I try to incorporate it in almost all of my other mini series because you guys love it so much. But the one thing that I've wanted to really talk about is the fact that some of these cases are solved and you think that brings enough closure to the family until the killer takes one last stab and refuses to admit where the body is, which is the last I feel like step of closure for the family. And unfortunately, once cases are solved, they're not interesting anymore to the media and no one wants to talk about them anymore. The family has to sit there knowing what happened, usually very detailed to their loved one and not be able to lay them to rest. And that has to be the worst feeling. And so if I can do something about it, then I'm surely going to. So today's video is on Danielle Jones and this is a messed up, messed up situation, messed up case. It disgusted me the entire time I was researching it, but it's going on 17, 18 years now that her family has been desperately trying to find her body. Because within a year of her murder, the person responsible was charged and put in prison for life. So that's, you know, there wasn't very much time of questioning who did it, but there has been an insane amount of time not knowing where she's at. Danielle was last seen alive on the 18th of June in 2001, walking from her home in East Tilbury, Essex to go to her bus stop. Danielle was the youngest of three siblings and she was just your typical 15 year old girl. She wanted to listen to pop music, dance around in her bedroom. She was just a carefree young girl and she had plans to work with the children when she finished with school. She was known to be very, very caring, compassionate, loving and they had a lot of hopes for her future, but that unfortunately was all stripped away from her. Morning she went missing around 8 a.m., Danielle left her home to walk to the bus stop. However, she never made it on the bus and she never made it to school that day. She was immediately reported missing and tips started flowing in fast. Within just a few short days that Danielle went missing, they already had a prime suspect. One of the tips led police to her own uncle. Stuart Campbell, her uncle, was a father to two children. His wife was the sister of Danielle's father. And within five days of Danielle's disappearance, police pretty much knew that he had something to do with it. Now, they don't go into very much detail as to why, even to this day. I'm very interested to know where the original tip came in from, but they had enough within that very first week to know he was the person who did it. They spent a few days actually delaying his arrest out of fear of what might happen to Danielle. They thought it was very possible that he had held Danielle hostage somewhere. They thought he was the only person that knew where she was, had access to her, and they didn't want to put her life in jail. When they finally brought Campbell in, he was uncooperative the entire time. And at one point in the interrogation, he refused to answer, I think it was over 50 separate questions. And because he wouldn't answer to anything and they had no solid evidence, they had no choice but to release him. So they started slowly putting the tips together in hopes of maybe gathering more so they could finally nail down her possible abductor slash murderer. They found the morning Danielle disappeared, a girl matching her description went up to a blue van on the way to the bus stop. And this young girl talked to the man in the van for a minute and then got in and they drove off. Thinking it was possibly an abduction and also possibly a murder, they started to look in the Tilbury Marshes, hoping that they didn't find her body, but checking just in case. They even released a home video of Danielle across all sorts of media, just hoping that maybe they could jog someone's memory and someone else would come forward with a more solid tip. They decided to check her phone to see if they could gather any more tips on what might have happened and they stumbled across something very interesting. Hours after Danielle went missing, she sent an interesting text message to her uncle. It was worded in a way that Danielle wouldn't normally word it and it was all uppercase. It said something along the lines of, thanks Uncle Stu, I love you, you're the best, tell my mom I'm sorry. Like just very, very strange and out of place and she would have had no reason to really send this text message. They continued their search with over 400 volunteers and I think around 70 police officers. They searched neighboring fields, more marshes. Every single time they came back with nothing. By July 1st, police had received more calls in about this blue van. The same blue van had been seen on at least two other occasions and it was always approaching young girls between the ages of I think 13 and 16 years old. 
So they came to the conclusion that whoever was in this blue van wanted desperately to abduct or at least talk or take advantage of these young girls in the same age group as Danielle. On July 12th, three boys came forward and claimed that that morning on the way to the bus stop, they did see Danielle. They said that she was heading in the right direction and then she doubled back to go seemingly back to her house and this is where she was spotted talking to the person in the blue van. They still believed at this point because her uncle had a blue van that he was the suspect but they still couldn't find anything in their searches so there was nothing really to pin on him. By August Danielle's mother did not believe she was alive anymore but in a desperate attempt to still get some answers because despite her fear that Danielle wasn't alive anymore she still wanted to bring at least her body home to lay her to rest. They went door to door with over 1,500 flyers that had her name on it and all the information of her disappearance. Then a very significant lead came in and they still have not exactly released what this lead was, but it led them to a home in Gray's Essex, which interestingly enough was the neighborhood that her uncle lived in. The following day, Stuart Campbell was arrested in connection with Danielle's murder. He gave them the alibi of being at a DIY store about 30 minutes away, but this was quickly proven wrong. Location, technology, and phones was just becoming a thing, and they were able to pinpoint exactly where the text message was sent from Danielle's phone, and it just so happened to be in almost the exact same location that Campbell's phone was in, which I'm assuming was probably at his home, meaning that he lied about where he was that day, which just makes him look that much more guilty. They took a deeper look into the text message that was sent from Danielle because her parents were 100% certain that she did not send the text message, and after doing forensic author analysis, they were able to confirm that it had not been Danielle that sent the text message, but it had been Campbell in an attempt to make it look like he had nothing to do with whatever happened to her and to make it look like she was still alive. They soon found out that Campbell had developed a very inappropriate relationship with Danielle and Danielle wanted absolutely nothing to do with it and this made him angry. He became obsessive and would bombard her with multiple text messages. He would show up at her bus stop when she would get off to return home and he would demand to drive her the rest of the way home. By November 14th, 2001, police decided that they had enough evidence in the case to charge Campbell with the murder of Danielle Jones, despite the fact that they were unable to locate her body and he was incredibly uncooperative. By October 14th, 2002, his trial had started. While on trial, they pointed out that a witness had called in claiming to see a blue van and the same witness confirmed that it matched the blue van that Campbell owned. They then revealed that in their search of Campbell's home, they found a bag that he used for photography that I will get into a little bit later. And inside this bag that was found in the loft of his home was a lip gloss owned by Danielle, DNA tested to match Danielle, along with a bloody pair of stockings that had Danielle's DNA as well as Campbell's on it. Inside that same bag were items like underwear, bikinis, and handcuffs, and other inappropriate items. Campbell had apparently helped Danielle set up her cell phone, and while they were searching his home, they found a little piece of paper stuffed in his wall, I think, that had Danielle's phone and then her passcode to it so he would be able to enter it. They also had found a diary in his home it revealed that he had an inappropriate obsession with teenage girls and had pages of him admitting to manipulating teenage girls into taking photos for him. And despite mentioning all these other things that he did to other teenage girls, the bulk of the entire diary was dedicated to his obsession with Danielle. They also found that a key had been given to Campbell while the Jones family was on vacation at one point and he used that key to come in and go through her room and leave her creepy notes everywhere. Danielle's mom revealed that just weeks before she disappeared, she came home one day after school and her uncle was the one who dropped her off, meaning he bombarded her at the bus stop and demanded to take her home. And when she walked into the house, she seemed very flustered and upset. And when her mother asked her what was wrong, she said that she had a weird situation happen with her uncle at his home and then didn't want to talk about it anymore. But her mother noticed that she had marks all over her neck. 
They found through searching his internet that he actually had fabricated an entire business online posing as a modeling agency under, I think, Cinderella photography where he would specifically try to lure in young girls in the same age group to take pictures of them and it was all inappropriate things like he would bring them to his home and make them take pictures in bikinis. He would approach these young girls at the bus stop, at malls, at parks, different areas and hand them these fake business cards in hopes that they would contact him. And they even found pictures that he took of girls that had no idea he was taking pictures of them. He would sit in his front window at home, wait for young girls to pass by, and then would take pictures of them. Just absolutely horrifically disgusting behavior. They found it interesting as well because he even met his wife at the age of 23 and she was only 15 years old at the time and he approached her while she was in a bikini at a pool. But that to police indicated that he has always had some sort of obsession with girls between 13 and 15 years old. Investigators thought that he had had enough of Danielle denying him over and over again. And they think that morning he showed up to her bus stop like he always would and offered to take her to school but instead Instead, he took her to his house. They think there was some sort of altercation there, but they're pretty sure it made him mad enough to where he killed her based on the blood that was found on her stockings. And somehow he managed to dispose of her body without leaving anything behind. With all this evidence pointing straight to Campbell, he was found guilty on December 19th of 2002 and sentenced to life in prison plus 10 more years for abduction. And he had no possibility of parole until 2021, which we are getting way too close to that year. While this trial and the conviction of this man that, you know, the whole family was supposed to trust has given her parents some sort of closure, they still have not had the chance to lay her body to rest. And he, to this day, remains completely uncooperative. He will not say where he put this poor young girl. He even found after his trial that in 1989, he had forcibly held a 14 year old girl in his home to take inappropriate pictures of her and she had reported it. Since being in prison in 2004, he put in an appeal on his case under the claims that the evidence of his obsession with Jones and underage girls should have been excluded from the case. Why that should have been excluded? Like that to me makes no sense. Yeah, you want to exclude it because it makes you look incredibly guilty, but when you were the last known person to have been seen with her, I think it's crazy that he really thought he could get by with that. And then apparently also one of the jurors in his case was a neighbor of a police officer that was investigating the case, but his appeal was denied. Police have vowed to keep this case open until they bring home the body of Danielle. This, the whole entire time I was researching it, this is a prime example of amazing, amazing police work. These police officers have since conducted more searches 17 years later, they are still desperately doing everything. They are exhausting every resource. They're not half-assing because too much time has passed by. They are seriously trying to find this girl to bring her home to her family. Most recently in February of 2017, police began to really revisit the case more so than they had been. Police went to search garages in Stifford Clay's Thurrock. They apparently had already searched some of these garages. They had received some sort of tip that there was a man exhibiting unusual behavior by the garages at the time that Danielle went missing. They had received almost an identical tip in 2001 and they actually went to search almost 1,000 different garages in their initial searches for Danielle. But for some reason, this particular area that the person said this man was acting unusual in didn't get searched so they decided to go back now. Now they're also trying to figure out why it was never searched because this is a very serious tip. This particular garage is only I think one mile away from where Campbell lived 
and he owned one at the time so this obviously pissed a lot of people off because it should have been searched but all they could do was make up for it and they absolutely did they sectioned off this entire block of garages they brought in all sorts of equipment it was guarded by police officers nobody in or out they broke apart concrete floor they dug down as deep as they could they brought in dogs and used special equipment like ground penetrating radar they even brought in forensic anthropologists. They did everything they could, but despite this tip seeming pretty credible, they were not able to find Danielle. Even to this day, Campbell shows absolutely no sign of remorse. He is completely uncooperative. The chances of him giving anything up at this point, it's been 17, almost 18 years, and he still isn't saying anything unfortunately i think is slim to none so they are revisiting everything in the case going over every single bit of information to see if they need to search places again um, trying to find other pathways that weren't taken before and they're just hoping that by some chance of luck either he will say something or they will just end up finding her her parents are so incredibly thankful that the police are still actively investigating her case they said their life has just been hell ever since and while they're happy he is away and he is doing time for his horrific crimes not having her home is worse than anything they could have ever imagined not being able to lay her to rest or go and visit her grave leave her flowers on her birthday just sit there and talk to her knowing that she's there has been so difficult to deal with and it has really affected them and will always affect them this is one of those times where i hope my video reaches the right person that someone remembers seeing something that they might not have thought was important the day that it happened but even if you don't think something is important even if you think it's something so small it could change everything it could completely crack a case if you lived in the area or you were in the area at that time think back share it with people who were as well because there's no way he disposed of her body and not one person noticed something strange if you saw a blue van that day in a strange location maybe by a body of water or by a park or something please please think to report it we spend a lot of time hoping cases are solved and the killer is caught and it is a whole different world when the killer is caught but you still can't bring your loved one home and i feel horribly for the people who have to experience that but i want to thank you guys so much for watching don't forget to share this video give it a huge thumbs up and hit the subscribe button to be a member of the howlin fam and i will see you in my next video bye guys